Uh, good evening, viewers and uh, listeners of Concerned Citizens Media. Uh, thank you again for joining me. Uh, I always appreciate your presence. Today is January the 11th, 2023. Thank you for coming back. I have uh, uh, several news updates to share with you. Uh, I will uh, start by reading news update. Then I have uh, about four uh, different videos I selected for you from uh, different media for today's news update. Thank you again for coming back. So let's get started. <coughs> uh, okay, the first one is uh, is a confirmation I reported uh, before on a video uh, or more liberation army uh, fighters uh, breaking the prison cell and the releasing uh, uh, Oromos, Oromo prisoners who are uh, unjustifiably detained by Prosperity Party. Uh, so this is a confirmation uh, reported on at this standard. So I have three different news, I think two or three uh, news updates from uh, at this standard. Let me read what it says about OLF fighters break into uh, prison cells. Uh, a government official and uh, residents told at this standard that members of the Oromo Liberation Army, OLE, a rebel group operating against the government forces in Oromia region and often referred as Shani by the government, broke into a zonal correction facility in Bule Hora town in West Guji zone, southern Oromia, on Saturday, January 7, 2023, and set more than 480 prisoners free. 480. Or almost. Or almost. I, you know, they just, I, I, I reported uh, on Saturday uh, or Sunday, uh, Prosperity Party just storing Oromos, young and old, in illegal prisons by just by blaming them on Akshani supporters. So freeing 480 uh, victims uh, from prison cell is a victory for Oromos. <clears throat> Both the government official and the resident recounted that the rebel forces broke into a zonal facility which is found in uh, Koro Gudina village and carried out offensive against the security guards of the center on Saturday night at around midnight. Deputy Mayor of Bulehora town, Girja Urag Urago, told at this standard that members of the rebel group broke into the correction facility after they killed five members of the security guards who were on duty. Some members of the rebel group carried out a systematic operation to break into the correction center, killed five security guards of the correction center, and set about 480 to 500 prisoners free, Girja said. According to the official, the rebel forces didn't engage or defeat the government forces operating in the area. They rather systematically broke into the correction facility. However, a resident who lives near the overrun prison told Addis Standard that <clears throat> there was an intense fighting between the forces in the area. <clears throat> The gunshot started at about 11.30 p.m. and continues to 3.30 a.m. 
there was a heavy fighting between the forces. The rebel forces broke into the correction center after they prevailed over the government forces, said a resident who asked to be anonymous. Another witness corroborated the same account of event, adding that the persisting insecurity in the zone has led to mass displacement and a related humanitarian crisis such as malnutrition for over two years. <clears throat> On 3rd January, the Ethiopian National Defense Force, ENDF, said a renewed military operation in southern Oromia aiming to destroying the rebel group operating in the area and stabilizing the region has been successful and that it has liberated several villages in the southern Oromia. Over the last few weeks, members of the national paramilitary parliament elected from Oromia have been calling on the government to find a peaceful path to end the war in Oromia and called all stakeholders, including community members and the elders to put pressure on both the government and the militant to end the war. But both the federal and the Oromia regional government repeatedly announced that it will not sit down for talks with militants. It says have no political agenda, but will welcome those who come putting their weapons down. The armed rebels on their part have been saying that they will negotiate in the presence of a credible third party. Ole didn't respond to Addis Standard's inquiry to comment on the attack on the Bulehora correction facility and the subsequent killing of security guards and the release of detainees. So that's credit. Uh, for this reporting at this standard. So, uh, I showed you uh, a oil forces uh, breaking into uh, uh, the prison cell in Bulehora in the last uh, broadcast. And, uh, oil forces saying victory, victory for oil, victory for Romo people. Uh, they are freeing the Oromo prisoners. So really, uh, I commend, I commented on that one. Uh, this this uh, successful oil operation should continue to free all Oromos, political and non-political, ordinary Oromos who are stored in so many prison cells in Oromia and elsewhere. So. Uh, the Prosperity Party, led by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, refused to sit down with uh, oil forces, claiming they have no chain of command. But that's a lie. That's an excuse to continue the bloodshed in that country. And uh, we all should put pressure, the international community, US, European Union, UN, and African Union, they should put pressure on Abiy Ahmed uh, in the same way they did uh, uh, for Tigray uh, region, so they can sit down and end uh, or stop unnecessary bloodshed in Oromia region. Uh, this one is about uh, AU, AU, African Union Monitoring Team, confirming uh, PPLF uh, disarming heavy weapons. And uh, this is verified already by a monitoring team. Let me read what it says. <clears throat> AU monitoring team confirmed handing over of heavy weapons by Tigrayan forces, uh, neither foreign nor non-Ethiopian uh, National Defense Forces uh, report withdrawing from Tigray region. So it's supposed to happen. The Eritreans and uh, the uh, the Amara and the Fano militia are supposed to get out from the Gray region, but that's not happening. But 
the Tigray Defense Force or TPLF decided to give up their heavy weapons. So that's that's their decision. I hope they will not be a victim of these uh, uh, brutal gangsters, militias, and the Eritrean forces. <clears throat> I hope they will have some kind of protection. The African Union appointed monitoring, verification, and a compliance mission, MVCM team, has confirmed launch of the disarmament process of Tigrayan combatant as Tigrayan forces handed over heavy weapons to the Ethiopian National Defense Forces on Tuesday, 10 January. Tigray's move is in compliance with the disarmament of Tigray armed combatant stipulated on the executive declaration of the modalities for the implementation of the Pretoria Agreement, which was signed in Nairobi on 12 November, Article 2.1D, which stated that disarmament of heavy weapons will be done concurrently with the withdrawal of foreign and non-ENDF non forces from the region. However, neither the withdrawal of foreign nor non-ENDF forces was announced together with the handing over of heavy weapons. Both Eritrean and the neighboring Amara region forces are still inside the Tigray region, controlling western Tigray parts of southern and northern as well as northeastern parts of the regional state. There is no official statement uh, both from the federal government and the Tigray region officials on the matter. But speaking during the press conference, a representative from the AU MVCM said, we have seen handing over and taking over military hardware by both the Tigrayan Defense Forces and the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, regional broadcaster Tigray Television reported. A video displayed by the regional media showed that showed the AU MVCM team witnessing the handing over ceremony of the heavy weapons by the Tigrayan forces to the Ethiopian military at Agule, Agule about 30 kilometers north of regional capital Mekale, where the heavy weapons were collected. Included the military equipment are tanks, armored vehicles, heavy mortars, guns, anti-tanks, anti-tank guns, Urals, and rocket-loaded cars, which were handed over to the Ethiopian National Defense Forces contingent. Oh, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. They need, they need, really, they need uh, a guarantor of peace, or a protection from Eritrean forces or from those uh, Fano uh, militia and Amara militia who are still in the, in the area uh, after they hand over all these heavy weapons. Um, so they need protection from these forces, either by international or uh, uh, monitoring team or by uh, uh, Ethiopian uh, National Defense Force. So we will see. Representatives from both Ethiopian government and the Tigray authorities' sides have also confirmed the disarmament of heavy weapons by Tigrayan forces during a joint press conference in Mekele. A representative from the Ethiopian National Defense Force, ENDF, Lieutenant Colonel Alam Tadessa said during the joint press briefing that the disarmament began according to peace agreement signed between Ethiopian government and the Tigrayan authorities in Pretoria on 2nd November. We have disengaged from our front lines. Tigrayan forces have also done the same. Now we have come to Agule, Agule, Agule this day where 
the heavy weapons are collected. We have received the weapons from Tigray Defense Force in the presence of AU observers, he said. Getacho Radda, spokesperson of TPLF and a member of the Central Command, tweeted saying that Tigray has handed over its heavy weapons as part of its commitment to implementing the Pretoria Agreement and that the AU MVCM confirmed it. We hope and expect this will go a long way in expanding the full implementation of the agreement, he added. The African Union Monitoring, Verification and the Compliance Mechanism, AU MVCM, was officially launched, uh, officially launched in McAlee on 29 December. Major General Stephen Radina from Kenya has been appointed to lead the mission along, alongside Colonel Rufai Umar Mari, Mariga of Nigeria and the Colonel Tefo Sekole of South Africa. Credit again at this standard. So uh, the commitment on, on the compliance of the agreement on uh, the Tigrayan authority side is appreciated uh, and the same should be uh, applied on uh, Ethiopian government, especially to demand to demand the withdrawal of Eritrean forces uh, from any inch, any inch of the Tigray region. They have no business. They have no business of staying there. And uh, all these are uh, found on the Amara militia. So after that, after this is confirmed, the next step for all engaged in the Tigray region is accountability and allowing UN back uh, investigative team, expert of three people, to go and uh, you know investigate who did what. Then we uh, we uh, we waiting for that report and accountability uh, from uh, Eritrean side, Amara militia, Fano militia, uh, Ethiopian federal forces, including the prime minister who ordered this operation. So we are waiting for that one. So justice should not be uh, uh, should not be ignored. But the first step is first remove all these foreign forces and stabilize. Uh, peace in the region, then allow these people to have uh, unfettered access to wherever they want to uh, go and investigate the crime committed, all the atrocities, and possibly bring all the golds, all the materials taken from the Tigray region into Eritrea and other regions too. <laughs> this is about the pressure on Eritrean troops withdrawal. Pressure is uh, coming from one London-based group. Let me read what it says. Eritrean troops under pressure to withdraw from uh, Ethiopia's Tigray region. Christ a Christian Human Rights Foundation based in the United Kingdom has called for immediate withdrawal and the disengagement of Eritrean troops from the Tigray region. Hours after authorities in the northern part of Ethiopia confirmed that they had surrendered weapons to the federal government. The, the Christian Solidarity Worldwide, CSW, noted that the involvement of Eritrean troops in Tigray has been huge noting that the time has come for the soldiers to return back to their country for the purpose of stability in the Horn of Africa nation, which has been in conflict for the last 32 months. I agree. They have no business staying there. They have to go back. CSW, through joint uh, head of ad advocacy and the team leader, for Africa and the Middle East, 
Kaha Taza Gondwe said the presence of Eritrean troops in Tigray had substantially slowed down peace progress within the country. A few of the Eritrean soldiers had withdrawn from the holy city of Aksum. The continuing presence of troops implicated in the commission of the gravest of international crimes constitute a clear threat both to the peace process and to the lives of Tigrayan civilians. Mrs. Gondowe, Gondo, Gondwe says in a Thursday, January 5 report. She adds, we call on the African Union and the rest of the international community to ensure the immediate withdrawal of Eritrean troops from Ethiopia, including by formulating and initiating additional targeted sanctions and a comprehensive arms embargo, if deemed necessary. We also call for the demobilization of conscripts and urge the Eritrean government to end its military adventurism and focus instead on re respecting and fulfilling the rights and the freedom of Eritrean citizens, ensuring that they are finally able to enjoy the dividends of their hard-won independence, the CSW official says. That's true. Let them enjoy their freedom. They fought Ethiopia for many years. They got their independence. So please take your freedom. Stay home. Don't cross over and create problem uh, in, you know, in Tigray. Now, according to several reports, uh, also creating uh, trouble uh, in Oromia region. So please stay, Eritreans. Stay out of Ethiopia's business. Enjoy your freedom. You demanded, you fought for it. So stay there. Stay there. And, uh, and uh, uh, when the time comes, bring back all the golds, all the material resources you took from Tigray region. Please bring back. I hope to see uh, this and other accountability in the future. I hope. Whether in Ethiopian court or international criminal court. <clears throat> the CSW team rejected claims that Eritrean troops had complied with the peace accord by withdrawing, arguing that they were still subjecting people to unwarranted torture in Tigray. According to the Christian human rights entity, the recent uh, detention of a Catholic bishop and the priests in Eritrea occurred against the backdrop of atrocities in the country and the neighboring Ethiopia. Ethiopia maintains that the troops have left as part of the implementation of the peace deal. This is Ethiopian side, ABE side. They're just, uh, you know, doing whatever they're doing behind door. They cannot say anything officially. Officially. But several reports still talking about Eritrean's presence in Tigray. Eritrea is heavily involved in the civil unrest in Ethiopia and the arrests and the subsequent release of the Catholic clergy occurred against the backdrop of the punitive door-to-door -door roundups and the forcible conscription of Eritrean citizens of all ages, which continue despite the African Union brokered cessation of hostilities, the Human Rights Foundation report. According to the foundation, Eritrea is not a party to the peace agreement and its troops have also continued to violate the rights of Tigrayan civilians. The country dispatched troops to assist Ethiopian National Defense Forces who were at loggerheads with TPLF. Although some recent reports have indicated that Eritrean troops have withdrawn from towns including Aksum and Shire, 
other details ongoing violations including the murder of two young men by Eritrean troops in Aksum on 3rd January while photographs continue to emerge allegedly showing Eritrean troops on the streets of Shire, the entity reports. This comes as the Tigray People Liberation Front through spokesperson Geta Churreda confirming that the outfit has surrendered weapons as part of the peace deal in the region. Besides the withdrawal of Eritrean troops, Ethiopia was also asked to restore basic services such as banking, electricity, telecommunications, and humanitarian assistance in Tigray. Uh, credit for this one, Garowe Online News. <clears throat> This is about Darartu Tullu, athlete and uh, president of the Ethiopia Athletics Federation, taking uh, the Grand Athletes into Makali, the Grand region. That's a uh, uh, very uh, appreciative. Let me see. Ethiopian Athletes Federation president brings the Grand Athletes to Makali to meet families. Legendary athlete Darartu Tullu, president of the Ethiopian Athletics Federation, led a delegation of Tigrayan athletes and uh, members of the executive committee and others to Mekele in order to reconnect Tigrayan athletes with their families. <clears throat> According to the federation, the delegation left for Mekele uh, uh, this morning via Ethiopian Airlines flight. Okay, this is a little bit delayed. They already uh, uh, in Makale, maybe already returned to Addis Ababa. It's, it's a little bit delayed, and I um, apologize for that. In July last year, Derartu has pl pleaded with the government to remove the blockade that disconnected Grand Born gold medal winning athlete from reaching their parent in the Tigray region. As we know, the athletes from Tigray have not yet had the opportunity to find their families. I assume our Honorable President will definitely solve this problem. We think that our government will solve this problem. Darartu said during the welcoming ceremony held at the Grand Palace. Because we have athletes in Tigray to line up a whole heartedly for the next tournaments and uh, so that our happiness can come true. Native Tigrayan woman athlete uh, Goti, 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 Tom, huh? Goti Tom Gabrasilase uh, Lesenbet Lesen, Gide and uh, Gudaf a guy were at the forefront of Ethiopia's athletics team that placed the country second in the medal table only to the host USA at the 18 World Athletics Championship by winning three of the four gold medals. Ethiopian athletics team also fetched four more silver and two bronze medals. The welcoming ceremony was clouded with sobering reflection as both the athletes and their parents spoke publicly about the pain of not seeing each other during the two years of blockade that disconnected Tigray from the rest of Ethiopia. The delegation travel is taking place amid confusion due to inexplicable travel restriction banning young Tigrayan between the ages of 16 and 65 from leaving the Alula Abanega International Airport in Mekele, the capital of Tigray region. Credit for this one again at this standard. So uh, we should appreciate uh, uh, Commissioner, Deputy Commissioner uh, and uh, uh, President of Ethiopian Athletics Federation, Dara Kutulu. She deserves credit. She deserves recognition 
for air action. Uh, that is, you know, the true sign of Ethiopianism. If you want to talk about Ethiopia as a whole country, when one region is bleeding, when one region is in pain, you share the pain. You speak for that people, for that region. So what she did that, she did that during a difficult time when everyone, uh, when others are scared of talking about this and other issues, uh, scared of the Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and the Prosperity Party official. She took the risk and uh, challenged uh, the authority uh, to allow this to grant to uh, have a visit to the family and also to uh, have an opportunity to take part in the international competition. Uh, there is uh, a lot of attempt uh, to deny these Tigrayan athletes not to go for competition. She did a great job in handling that one. Also, to settle the huge problem we have in Oromia region. Uh, it's a peace uh, issue, uh, the instability in the region. And she was, uh, you know, talking seriously why we couldn't have peace, uh, why we cannot solve our problem, almost in general. Also, she uh, also she uh, uh, talked to uh, OFECO members and others uh, to end the hunger strike. Uh, Johar Mohammed and Bakla Garba. Uh, she intervened personally to end the hunger strike. So she saved their lives and uh, she did a, you know, a very excellent job. Uh, so, so she deserved credit and uh, she deserved recognition for this uh, uh, tough stand, very tough stand uh, against uh, this prime minister and these uh, prosperity party officials. That's a challenge, you know. The grants during these two war, uh, two years war, they were isolated. They are picked from every corner of Ethiopia, just because of their Tigrayans, and uh, de, you know, arrested, detained. Uh, some of them killed, tortured, and uh, some of them uh, lost their property, confiscated their properties, just because of their from Tigray region. I never seen such kind of war. We have a war before with the Tigray region, but not with the entire society. This has happened under Prime Minister Abiyan. That's why we are calling for, uh, uh, you know, criminal uh, accountability. We are calling for justice. Be patient. The day may come within a year, two years, 10 years, 20 years, nobody knows, but one day, all of them will come to justice. Uh, this is from US State Department uh, about uh, Negev Forum, Negev Forum groups. The Negev Forum Working Group and the Regional Cooperation Framework press statement, Anthony J. Blinken, Secretary of State. January 10, 2023. So this is released on January 10. I welcome the inaugural meeting of the Negev Forum Working Group hosted by the United Arab Emirates on January 9 to 10 in Abu Dhabi. Excuse me. Senior officials from the government of Bahrain, Egypt, Israel, Morocco, the United Arab Emirates, and the United States discussed opportunities to advance initiatives that encourage regional integration, cooperation, and development for the benefit of their populations and the wider region. This includes initiatives that could strengthen the Palestinian economy and improve the quality of life of the Palestinian people. The United States strongly supports this effort to build bridge and opportunity across the region. I thank the United Arab Emirates for hosting this important gathering. The Negev Forum Steering Committee also released the Negev Forum Regional Cooperation Framework, adopted November 10, 2022, 
codifying the structure and the goals of the forum and the recognizing the potential to build networks of cooperation to advance common interest, regional stability, and prosperity in the Middle East. The framework affirmed that these relations can be harnessed, harnessed, harnessed to create momentum in Israel-Palestinian relations towards a negotiated resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and as part of effort to achieve a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace. Uh, I would like to see that. Uh, I, I hope it will not be just uh, uh, done for the talk of, for the uh, sense of talking. The United States will continue to work with our partners in the region to promote and implement this vision including at the upcoming Negev Forum Ministerial Credit U.S. State Department. So Negev Forum Working Group uh, consists of Egypt, uh, Bahrain, Morocco, United States, and they are talking about cooperation and benefit for the Palestinian Israel issue. So I hope to see that. I hope, please, fasten it. I want to see the uh, permanent cessation of hostilities and the lasting peace between Palestine and Israel and uh, the economic cooperation and the development in the region. These are nice, nice words. Okay, the last one for today. This is uh, the White House press release on Illinois become the ninth state on banning uh, heavy weapons, assault weapons, uh, which uh, some criminals use to shoot students in our schools in the United States. So this is a good sign. So let me read what it says. Illinois has now become the ninth state across America to pass an assault weapons ban and take bold action to keep weapons of war off America's streets. Today, President Biden commends the leadership of Illinois Governor J.B. Prisker, House Speaker Chris Walsh, Senate President Dan Harmon, Representative Bob Morgan, and the numerous advocates survivors and elected officials whose tireless effort turned the pain of Highland Park and other acts of gun violence into meaningful action on behalf of all Illinoisans. Too many Americans across the country continue to lose their lives or their loved ones to gun violence. This is why President Biden has taken historic action to reduce gun violence, including signing the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, the first significant piece of gun safety legislation in nearly 30 years, into law last summer. The President has continued to press for more action to keep our homes, schools, and communities safe including federal laws requiring background checks for all gun sales and a ban on assault weapons and high-capacity magazines. In the meantime, he continues to urge other states to join California, New Jersey, Connecticut, Hawaii, Maryland, Massachusetts, New York, Delaware, Washington, D.C., and now Illinois to ban assault weapons at the state level to save lives. Thank you, Mr. President. I agree with your assessment. We need to end uh, uh, this uh, school uh, shooting and uh, other uh, public areas. So an assault uh, 
should end and the continuous breaking news this school attack these children killed so those should be in and a ban on assault weapon should reach to all states possibly at a federal level it is a law in a federal level it will uh, control all all states so these are uh, mostly i think democrat states massachusetts illinois new york these are mostly democrat states so the republicans state must take action to stop uh, you know the massacre of our children and uh, sometimes shoppers at shopping malls. So let's ban all these heavy weapons, machineries, which are maybe necessary war for war, for white, for fighting the war, but not necessary uh, to be used in urban uh, areas. So please continue your pressure. Thank you, Mr. President, for your uh, service for the nation to stop this uh, killings. So that's the end of the reading. Let's uh, share some short, short videos I selected for you. So let's uh, share some videos I selected for you today from different media and conclude today's presentation. Thank you again for coming back. There we go. A call by the African Union to get permanent representation to the United Nations Security Council has hit a snag after it failed to get the endorsement from China's new foreign minister on Wednesday during a visit to Ethiopia. The EU chairman termed Africa's lack of permanent representation at the Security Council as a burning issue since most issues on the Council agenda are usually related to African countries. The African continent, with 1.3 billion inhabitants and 54 member states, has the right to be a member of this international governance and a permanent member of the Security Council. During the press conference, the Chinese foreign minister rejected the idea of China and U.S. competing and called for mutual respect. The China-U.S. relationship must not be one about competition. It must not be based on a win or lose zero-sum game. If that is the case, there will be no winners and the world will suffer. The relationship should be one based on mutual respect and win-win cooperation. This comes after the United States held U.S.-Africa summit in Washington last week in a bid to reassert its influence in Africa. The foreign minister has begun a week-long trip to Africa where he is also expected to visit Angola, Benin, Egypt and Gabon. Look at this guitar pattern. What you're looking at is the key that unlocks the guitar neck forever. It lets you hit all the right notes without thinking. It lets you flow up and down the fretboard without hesitation. We just wanted to very quickly uh, break in uh, to that uh, ongoing tra uh, the Transport Select Committee with some breaking news relating to the U.S. and the uh, FAA, that's the Federal Aviation Authority. Uh, and uh, they've said uh, that uh, the system uh, that alerts pilots and other personnel about hazards and changes uh, across uh, the day uh, has been down, and that has led to... Uh, almost all flights being grounded, at least temporarily, uh, data from FlightAware uh, suggesting that 400 flights uh, or more than that were delayed at around 5.30 a.m. Eastern time, so that's 10.30 a.m. here, uh, and the latest uh, seems to suggest that um, the alert system is still not processing updates uh, uh, after so uh, an outage will bring you more on that, so but uh, certainly some major now, delays uh, at the very least uh, for flights time, uh, due to head to morning. the US uh, should be expected as things stand. We'll bring you more updates on that uh, as and when we have it. But let the leaders of the US, Canada and Mexico have wrapped up their North American summit, downplaying their frustrations with one another on migration and trade. 
offering a united front, President Joe Biden boasted about his new migration policy. We're working together to address this challenge in a way that upholds our nation's laws and protects the human rights of migrants facing desperate circumstances. We're also working together to take on the scourge of human smuggling and illegal drug trafficking. Tensions were front and center when Biden met his Mexican counterpart on Monday, who complained of abandonment and disdain for Latin America. The next day, Lopez Obrado announced the trio's revised plans to boost trade. We've agreed on strengthening our economic trade and commercial relations, and for that, we're going to be creating a joint committee aimed at planning and substituting imports in North America so that we might try to be increasingly self-sufficient. Pledging to promote prosperity for people throughout the hemisphere, the conference ended with an optimistic outlook. <clears throat> Simply, we are, and always will be, stronger together. Tens of thousands of people have been holding pro-democracy demos across Brazil after Sunday's attack on government buildings by supporters of the defeated former president, Jair Bolsonaro. Around 1,500 people involved in the earlier violence have been arrested. In a moment, Naomi Iqbal will have the latest on the aftermath of the riots. But first, here's Katie Watson at one of the pro-democracy so demos in Sao Paulo. Uh, protests, uh, this demonstration here in Sao of Paulo is one group. of many that have been called across the country in response to the events like, of Sunday. No, people here president. are showing that they're not going to take what they saw in Brasilia, Lula. the invasion of Congress, the Supreme Federal Court, and the Presidential Palace. People here are calling for punishment of those responsible. They're waving placards saying, without amnesty for the coup mongers. I spoke to one woman who said that this isn't about not agreeing, it's about allowing people to have different opinions and respecting democracy. And this is what this event is about. It's about moving forward and encouraging democracy in this deeply divided country. The cleanup operation is pretty much done here outside the presidential palace. You can still obviously see where the protesters caused huge damage. Now, President Biden and President Lula spoke on the phone, and Mr. Biden condemned the attack here in Brazil's capital. And of course, he can relate because the same thing happened in the U.S. two years ago. Of course, the crucial difference is that a, trans, a peaceful transfer of power had already happened here because Mr. Lula was inaugurated a week ago. But there is pressure building on Mr. Biden. Members of his party want the former Brazilian president, Bolsonaro, to be kicked out of America. He is, uh, according to his wife, currently in a hospital in Florida being treated with abdominal pains. And a lot of people here, including Mr. Lula, Blame Mr. Bolsonaro for the unrest because he refused to accept the election result. Uh, now, there is talk of an extradition, but we spoke to a justice minister here who said an extradition can only happen if there is a criminal complaint and a criminal investigation. Okay. So, yeah, this is some kind of a similar situation uh, with a former president, U.S. president, Donald Trump, who refused uh, the re, you know, accepting the result. So this, uh, this former Brazilian president also refusing the recognition of the Lula victory and, uh, you know, uh, maybe encouraging those protesters to go to the palace and uh, the parliament and uh, destroy uh, the properties, fight against the new president. So. That's not a good example of the United States. That's why uh, we are fighting uh, for freedom, democracy to sustain in this country, not to give up, not to be intimidated by some uh, wrong element. So let me conclude today's presentation and uh, I express my appreciation my gratitude uh, for Gerard Tutullo, Deputy Commissioner and the President of Ethiopian Federal uh, uh, Athletics Federation. As I said, she deserved a great credit to bringing people together.
and uh, you know fighting for the victims standing with the victims the grand victims uh, who uh, the Ethiopian authority tried to deny them uh, to go or, uh, to take part in the competition she fought hard and allow them to compete and get uh, the reward so she deserved credit we need an, uh, you know uh, uh, citizens like her to fight uh, for Ethiopians if you want to create a country uh, you know a, a united country everyone friendly to each other respecting each other fighting for each other's freedom justice equality in that in that country we need people like there are to Tulu and uh, we, you know uh, sh she should be encouraged to do more for the problem we have in Oromia region please speak up uh, please come out strongly the same way you did last time don't don't be silent don't be scared of Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed and those prosperity party officials just like other uh, uh, you know government officials their time will come to an end so don't scare of them this is only temporary they, they can intimidate you they can challenge you they can demote you because they have the power at this time but end your silence to end the ongoing uh, heavy military operation in Oromia region uh, you should be uh, you should be written in a golden book if you do if you do that Please do it. Don't hesitate. And uh, Oromos and other Ethiopians will be with you. If you speak up against this bloody war, Prime Minister and his party refuse to settle. And, uh, you, you know, trying to bring all weapons, all military uh, uh, maneuver, all military hardware into Oromia region uh, in, the name of, in the name of defeating Oromo Liberation Army. So please, the international community, the United States, European Union, UN, you should also end your silence to end the ongoing bloodshed, which is underreported uh, for the global community. That is my closing. Thank you for joining me. And uh, please share, comment, subscribe to my channel. And uh, I will be back with other news and updates. So long and take care.